WLTV, the number one wine show on the internet. And this is BBQ Center. Start the game! Let's go! We'll do it live. Okay. We'll do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! In a world permeated with barbecue websites under the control of tyrannical administrators, there was one man, a one-man army. He broke all the rules. He allowed his members to speak out, give their opinions, and make the website what it is today. Get ready for Greg Rempe and the Barbecue Central Show. From Cleveland, Ohio, it's the Barbecue Central Show. All right, welcome to the Barbecue Central Show. Let's get it as we race into the holiday season. It's the Barbecue Central Show, the show that talks about all things important in the world of barbecue and grilling, originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio, the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I am your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday evening. Welcome in. You want to jump in? Happy to have you. Phone call it 216-220-0966. You can also email the show if you would prefer. You can get in touch with the show by sending an email to greg at bbqcentralshow.com or on the Twitter and Instagrams at BBQ Central Show. Anything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, which is the bbqcentralshow.com. If you're looking for a way to get a heads up before the show actually hits the airways from 9 to 11, you can go to the website and sign up for the newsletter. Two things happen. You give me an email address. Maybe you don't give me... Do you have to put your name? I think I just require an email address because that's where the newsletter is going to be going. However, not only are you going to get that newsletter, which comes out just about 12 p.m. Eastern time, after you sign up the first time, you should get a follow-up email from me automatically generated. That gives my homemade barbecue sauce recipe. So if you have signed up recently and you've noticed that you haven't gotten that barbecue sauce recipe, A, check your spam first. If you still didn't get it, shoot me an email, greg at thebbqcentralshow.com, and I'll make sure that you get that barbecue sauce recipe. Just a special gift from me to you. Just for saying thanks and joining that newsletter. And it only comes out like once a week, as I had said. So I'm not bombarding you with all sorts of nonsense and tomfoolery. If I come across a great deal or I partner with somebody that's offering my listening audience an exceptional bargain, certainly I'll race that off to you and it's up to you to take advantage or not. But other than that, it's pretty standard fare. Tuesday around noon. There you go. Here's what's happening on the show coming up in about 11 minutes from now. He's been on this show a couple months ago, building smokers that, from an aesthetics standpoint, probably aren't the sexiest ones you've ever seen. A lot of them come with race car paint and 58 inches of insulation and very slick as far as the aesthetic look. So, while the aesthetic might not be super sexy, the sexy builds in with the way they cook, how popular they're becoming, and how quickly they're actually able to turn these around given the popularity. We'll be joined once again by J.D. Jimmy Daniel from Primitive Pit. Looking forward to talking with him. He's just launched, or I guess specifically relaunched, a YouTube series called Cutorials. We'll get into that. New episode just dropped today. We'll also talk a little bit more in-depth about the cookers. We didn't we planned to get into that the last time he was on. We didn't really get too far into it this time. 
But we'll talk with JD in about 10 minutes from now. And then at 35 past the hour, one of my favorite growing topics in this segment is pizza, specifically high heat pizza, whether that come through a Forno Bravo oven that you've personally imported from Italy, or maybe you have an attachment like I have or an accessory that goes in a cooker that you have to get you those high heat temperatures. And instead of being lazy like me, and I say lazy in the fact that I have a great Italian grocer a half a mile from my house and I'll go buy the pre-made pizza dough balls for 89 cents each. My guest at 935 is widely considered to be one of, if not the pizza expert in the industry. He's cooked on a number of implements. He's got a number of recipes, tips and tricks and techniques. Don't let the cold weather deter you from having pizza parties. I will be joined by none other than Matt Frampton, bbqrevolution.com. And then we'll move to the second hour. And it is the fourth Tuesday of the month, so you know we're going to refire the embedded correspondence segment. We will find gentlemen from Texas, that being Doug Scheiding, Steve Ray from Tennessee, Dave Huff from Oklahoma, and sitting in on a special night, John Solberg from Michigan, who will be talking about a specific item that I'm very excited about. So we'll have four... To start, John might drop off in the end, but he there will be four embedded correspondents and myself this evening, so that's your lineup for tonight's 120 minutes of a live fire talk and cooking. JD, Jimmy Daniel in the first segment, then we have Matt Frampton after him, second hour embedded correspondents. 216-220-0966, Greg at the BBQ Central Show. Dot com. Don't forget, you can follow me on social media, Instagram at BBQ Central Show. Same thing on the Twitters, Facebook.com slash BBQ Central Show. If you're watching on the Facebook page, you've already figured out how to find that. Go ahead and give me a like if you haven't. Bunch of different messages coming in from various platforms. This one coming in from Facebook, courtesy of John House. Greg, love the Michael Simon interview recently. Thanks for continuing to put in all the hard work and time on the show. Started listening way back in 2008 and have appreciated how far you've brought the show's content and quality. I don't even own a smoker at the moment, but still listen to the podcast each week on my commute. Keep up the great work. Hope you and your family have a great Thanksgiving. John, thanks for writing in. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving as well, along with all the other Central Lights. Appreciate you listening since 2008, my man. I'm no mathematician, but that's 10 years. One of the most loyal Central Lights, John, I have to say. So I appreciate you listening. Also got an email from Pete in Fort Lauderdale. And it says, Greg, I was listening to your most recent interview with Stephen Reichland the other day. And I have to ask, why do you think he seemed to go out of his way not to answer some of the questions you were asking him in your lightning round? I think they were all pretty innocuous and not too controversial by any stretch. Everything up until then was great, but not answering some stupid questions for fun seemed a bit stuffy to me. Just wondering if you had a take on it. I always podcast the show. Thanks for giving me content to keep me running through my day. Keep up the great work, by the way. Not that you asked, but the addition of the best of show this year continues to show us why you lead this arena and the rest weekly follow behind. Way behind. Regards, Pete in Fort Lauderdale. Pete, thank you. And of course I have a take on why Stephen didn't answer like three or four of those 10 or 11 questions that I asked him. I don't think Stephen is out to try and even remotely look like he might be offending anyone. So instead of just picking an answer, I mean, look, if you're tuning into the show and you hear me say, hey, you want to do lightning round? That should immediately be for entertainment value. So I will always operate on that. If I'm being interviewed and somebody says, let's do a lightning round. I'm going to answer A or B because that's the spirit, the fun of that whole lightning round thing, which, by the way, we'll be doing again this evening with my guests. So I think to have me ask Stephen, would you pick Bobby Flay or Alton Brown? He doesn't want to pick one over the other. So he says, I like them both. As he said, with uh, he didn't want to offend Sazerac or Old Fashioned. So he said he would have one of each. I don't think Sazeracs or Old Fashions have feelings. He might. 
So I don't think if it can perceive if it can be perceived in any way as a slight, Stephen will steer away from that. He's not trying to be controversial. He's still trying to appeal to everybody. That's certainly his prerogative. I, on the other hand, will give you if you ask, I will answer. Keep that in mind in real life. If you ask me a question, I will give you an answer. It might not be the answer you're looking for, but don't ask me if you don't want an answer. Final email coming in from Nate in Kennesaw, Georgia. Nate, I used to work for a company that was based out of Kennesaw, Georgia, and they tried to screw me out of money. You can believe it or not. Greg, loved your interview with Melissa Riome, the Grill Mama, last week. She was very gracious with her time and even more generous with her knowledge, especially when it came to social media stuff. Just getting into Instagram myself recently, it was great to hear her speak on the best practices of growing an engaged and loyal following base. Too bad she had to work on Thanksgiving. I'm glad we have folks like her and our healthcare system. Thanks for the great show. Regards, Nate. Nate, thank you. A lot of people jumping in over the past week. Happy to see it. You can leave me a message in various ways. You can bet that most likely they will show up in the beginning of this show or in the second hour of this show. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Pete. And thanks, John House, for writing it. Jimmy Daniel coming up out of the break. Let me talk to you quickly first about Big Papa Smokers, the number one online shop for all things barbecue. Their curated selection of only the best outdoor cooking and grilling supplies get you on the path to better barbecue results in no time. Everything at BigPapaSmokers.com has been Pitmaster approved by Sterling. Big Papa Ball himself, like those championship rubs and seasonings. Popular flavors like Sweet Money, Cattle Prod, Cash Cow, all proven winners on the competition circuit and in my backyard. Big Papa Smokers offers 13 perfectly balanced flavors that will transform ordinary meals into extraordinary. Whether you're cooking to impress the judges or your friends and family, Big Papa Smokers award-winning rubs and seasonings just don't disappoint. You can also pair them up with simply marvelous barbecue rubs and now you are using what's called the West Coast offense. However you see fit. They also are the proud owners of Granny's Barbecue Sauce. Looking for a new go-to barbecue sauce that pleases everyone? Granny's traditional yet powerful flavors remind us why we fell in love with barbecue in the first place. Find Granny's Barbecue Sauce and other top-rated barbecue sauces at BigPapaSmokers.com. And aside from those rubs and sauces, Big Papa's also offers the very best pellet, charcoal, and wood cookers available today. If you're looking for a versatile smoker that's easy to use, check out the Mac 2 Star General Pellet Grill. Big Papa Smokers is the exclusive Mac dealer and even offers special packages. Nobody else doing that. Not a fan of pellets? Fine. Take a look at the Old Hickory Ace BP, the only charcoal smoker that Big Papa trusts on his competition trailer. And if you're a backyard enthusiast like me looking for a durable and versatile grill that will last forever, the M Grill from Texas is just what you need. They're built like tanks. Not sure what kind of grill you need? Here's the truth. You really can't go wrong with any of those cookers featured on BigPapaSmokers.com website. They have something for every kind of backyard cook and budget. So here's the deal. Boost your barbecue skills with the help of Big Papa Smokers, the number one online barbecue store. Call them toll-free with questions. 877-828-0727. Say it with me. 877-828-0727. Or shop their website, BigPapaSmokers.com. That's B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A Smokers.com. We are back with Primitive Pits. Stick around. Be right back. Casting live from the Barbecue Central Show Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe.
Welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by Butcher Barbecue, makers of award winnings, rubs, sauces, spices, injections, grilling oils, all the Butcher Barbecue products tested on the competition circuit, as well as in the backyard. You can check out butcherbbq.com to stock up now. Always trust your butcher. All right. My first guest tonight going to pick up this conversation. Has anyone noticed that some of the most popular offsets are Texas style offsets? My next guest falls into that arena, but I think their cookers are pretty damn sexy too. I know I do. So let's head to the Traeger Grills hotline and whoop, welcome back, friend of the show. And hopefully we hear him this time right out of the game. Can you hear me? I can. JD is in. JD, how are you, buddy? What's going on to. All the central lights. We are excited to have you back in, JD. So, you know, let's put the pit stuff on hold just for a second and talk about something. I want to say it's <laughs> new, right? But I mean, it's kind Not of new to us. That's right. Of course, that's like the best thing. That's why I have my show for the last number of years. Uh, you have a quote unquote new show on YouTube called q -torials. And I say quote unquote new show because it was actually something. A number of years back that you already did, and now you're refiring a pretty successful idea. So I guess first and foremost, tell me a little bit about that original concept and when it started, why it went away, and why you brought it back. Well, um, I have a real early history with YouTube because of my music business past. We broadcast some of the first concerts and put some of the first concerts on YouTube. And I've had this infatuation with carrying cameras around for 20 years. And my wife will tell you it's partly annoying and she's grateful that I've got them. So we started doing this version of tutorials in 06 till roughly the end of 09. And uh, it was more of uh, alcohol-induced backyard barbecue. It didn't have any kind of uh, structure. And it was uh, really just a bunch of good friends. And we didn't do it uh, very consistently, but we had a lot of fun. And we pulled it off. I pulled it off based upon uh, being in the rental business. I didn't want anybody to stumble upon some of these videos and think I was a total uh, buffoon. Uh, but we ended up, you know, that's just kind of uh, bringing it back based upon just a passion for live fire cooking. And we have so much fun doing this and we're going to do kind of the same thing, but more structured. How successful was that initial run of tutorials? I mean, uh, I know it, it's hard to. In, you, in YouTube terms yeah. for the success of it, uh, when I pulled it off in 09, that's before content guys got paid. And by the way, I'm not doing this for, you know, any payment. I'm just doing it because I love doing it and I'm doing it just because it's it's an out, a creative outlet. But uh, that's before people got paid. And I was friends with a bunch of guys who were putting content out there. And I bet we had a couple videos that had seven digit likes, three or four videos. There was one that was really popular that um, more funny than anything. And then, you know, we had real good base of subscribers, but it was so inconsistent that, you know, I'm surprised that anybody really watched it at the same time. I remember, uh, you know, a few times going, "Whoa, this is this is this is something real," but back in that time in 2008, and nine, YouTube was still a platform where you know it wasn't very good video and quality wasn't quite where it's at today. And now it's it's competing with major networks and you know, but I I love it. I mean, I've been a part of YouTube as far as the talent and music. I've probably got 50 broadcasts musically that are up. Um, you know, I see them on YouTube. I just was watching watching one the other night. That um, great. It was actually watching on YouTube was better than watching on TV. Yeah, right. Uh, Primitive Pitch joining me here on the show, Jimmy Daniel. Uh, Jimmy just released. I believe it was today. Was your kind of a uh, would you call it a deconstruction of a Yoder's offset pit? Yeah, tutorials is a video blog of just really trying to cover the 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 people and the techniques and the tools of, of live fire cooking. And I'm really going to stick around the live fire cooking part of this thing. But I got a friend of mine, Jeff, uh, Jeff Hurd. Uh, he's out there now. Uh, he he and I have been friends for years. He's been talking to me about, you know, this smoker he had. And and um, I'd read a lot of great things about him, and it's a really good smoker. You can learn how, you can learn how to smoke on anything, as long as it draws uh, from the firebox to wherever it's exhausting. But uh, he's 
real meticulous and you know he's if you ever go into his shop he's in the in the grading business and he's got all these you know real uh, i guess set, set up with his tools and whatnot that will tell you that he's kind of a little bit ar but um he told me to man but so i took a look at it the very first time he's cooking i was like man the thing's got a tuning plate in there and I just might just pull the tuning plate. Well, he pulled the tuning plate out and it didn't really um, do much for him. So this summer he brought it to us and I cooked a brisket on it. I said, you know what, before I go cutting into this thing, it was beautiful. It's a beautiful looking smoker. I said, I just want to, you know, cook on it. So I cooked on it and made notes, which you should always make notes because that's the key to good barbecue. Right. Um, is, is filled up my notebook with some stuff that I would um, think, you know, modification would be nice to do and we we finally got around to doing it over sunday i guess and and uh invited chris over and chris is like i'm like you i don't want to be on camera but i'm really not going to be on the camera and uh we had a good time doing it we spent probably two hours to do the whole modification a little bit more than two hours and um i'll cook on it in two weeks and um i'm going to give a real blanket straightforward uh r response and answer back to jeff and publicly about how it smokes it might be a complete bomb i've got a feeling it's not going to be based upon it's now set up to where i know how to cook on that particular setup mm. it's kind of like any other device whether it's a golf club a fishing rod a tool if you know it and how it's set up i know it i'm going to be able to manage the fire and probably do okay with the brisket Jimmy Dana joining me here on the show. PrimitivePits.com is a website if you want to check it out while we're talking. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, – so, uh, sorry, let me ask you one more question about the tutorials. Is that something that you're going to be releasing weekly or – I mean, you know, that's like every the whole Tuesday deal now, right? Every Tuesday is the goal. Okay, so every Tuesday. Uh, every Tuesday is the goal. I literally stop and try to take about a 45-minute lunch or, you know, we'll just goof off and do, do it then and then on Sundays – um, but yeah, every the, the goal is every Tuesday, and I've been planning this for no joke for five years, um, and and it's just finally like you know what I'm gonna do it, and it it is something you know I spent my whole career on the other side of the camera, and you know uh, I'm sure a lot of folks probably have an opinion on man, you know how do you get in front of a camera and do all that stuff? Well, it's very uncomfortable, but it's it's an exercise of uh, learning how to be a narcissist. Uh, Jimmy, let's talk a little bit about your cookers. Um, I guess let's start specifically with the business market. So what percentage of your cookers are going into, I don't know if you would call it commercial or, or restaurant type settings versus a percentage that are going to people like me, like the consumer side or the end user side? Well, we, we did launch this summer in uh, July, uh, a consumer side, but we have been catering to the restaurants and caterers, and that's about 95% is going into restaurants. Wow. And some of them are catering and pop-up guys, but everything's going into the commercial setting. We'd still sell babes and we still sell the, uh, I, I consider our Bubba, the 250 model to be really a small commercial unit. There are four or five people that have them in their backyards. And uh, they're, they're backyard cookers. There's one guy in El Campo, Texas, that's got a babe and a uh, uh, 250 in his backyard. But everybody else is pretty much, it's a commercial, 500s of thousands are commercial. Is there just better margin in commercial stuff or is it just you get your hands on bigger tanks easier? Like what's the, yeah. or is that um, just how you started and, to, and that's where to, you keep it? Well, to be candid, the 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 babe, for instance, there. I mean, I see guys out there um, th that have a similar product. Mill Scale just launched a beautiful 94 gallon uh, cooker, and and uh, Moberg probably doesn't get in that space because there's no. But with the price of steel, the tariffs, there's no money in those little guys. Yep. Um, we do them for passion. We do them to kind of get our name out there. It's hard. When we launched them, we built 20 some of them, you know, 30 some, 40, 40 some total with both units. But um, I gotta be honest, it, it, the commercials have a little bit better uh, profit margin, but we sell our smokers for so cheap um, that, and I mean, you know, go get prices and come back to us, <laughs> but we want, we're passionate about putting people in the business, but we just really, uh, know that if the price of steel goes up or we get another crazy tariff or anything happens, you know, 
It's it's tough. It's slim pickings, but we do make better on the thousand and the five hundred gallons. The thousand, you know, there's there's some margin, and it, there's no margin if we spent two weeks to build it. But we've got a process to build them uh, relatively quick. Uh, Jimmy, let's talk a little bit about the evenness of the cooker because I think that's what people maybe don't take into account, especially the novice. They'll go into a big box store, they'll see a char griller, which looks like an offset. But it's drafty, it's very thin, it doesn't hold temperature very well, and it all of a sudden becomes quite a chore just to maintain some kind of temperature. Or you have to do all these crazy modifications that you have to find on the internet and you sink another couple hundred bucks to make it cook somewhat mediocre. How do you guys yeah. build yours and, and what are you doing, I don't know if you'd call it from an engineering standpoint or just from a knowledge standpoint in order to make it cook so even from left to right and front to back? Well, uh, first of all, starting out, it's a, it's a you know a refurbished uh, piece of steel that comes from a really good era in in our uh, in our steel working world. As far as the 50s and 60 model, 1950s and 60 model liquid propane tanks that we're we're you know recycling basically and turning them into cookers, they're really solid and they're going to be somewhat insulated so we got that going for us it's a good piece of steel and where i think a lot of people get into trouble is their their steel's not very thick so when you start putting heat and you know it's like a jet engine you're going to lose stuff as it goes throughout the chamber so one of the things that we try to do is we've trying to be really scientific with how we put the firebox onto the chamber and the smokestack draw. There's a bunch of different philosophies and opinions out there. We've just found what works for us. Matter of fact, we're working with a guy right now um, who is a CFD um, engineer, which stands for Computational Fluid Dynamics. Matter of that. fact, his NASCAR team at Penske just won the championship last weekend. Mm. And he's a Georgia Tech guy that's, that's helping us understand what goes on inside of a smoker because myself i've owned a bunch of smokers from from uh, reverse flows and all these different types of smokers throughout the years and if it looked cool and if i thought it was going to do something great to the meat then i bought into you know just the idea of oh yeah it's going to you know my weber whatever it's going to be great right. oklahoma joe it's great but i really never got to see the science of it until the last few years where you start seeing the CFD and it doesn't lie. It'll tell you where the hot spots are. And, and you know, that evenness that you get across the grates that some of the high line guys out there building thousand gallons and 500 gallons, it takes a lot of work. Some people fully insulate their firebox, which we've just built a few with fully insulated fireboxes. I'm not a personal uh, fan of it, but my client wanted them and uh, we like the semi insulated firebox because it, it breathes a little bit and it helps it burn a little bit more even to to reduce some of the hot spots. Mm. But it's just really hyper detail. And, you know, there are guys out there in their garages that are building cookers. And, you know, you may not get it right the first time, but you're going to realize where the problems are if you cook a lot. So then you'll start making the modification. Take notes. And, um, you know, that's how we've gotten to where we're burning plus or minus three or four degrees across a 12 foot grate. Jimmy, let's talk a little bit about building a fire and then maintaining a fire, especially in offsets. I think that's where a lot of struggle can come in. Even if you have, you know, I mean, I have a Lang 36-inch uh, patio, and I think after looking at a Moberg and looking at yours, the firebox is undersized. It might be that grate that's in there. I probably should rip that out and, and build fire on the floor because I lose coals. There's some things that make the task a little bit more of a pain, I guess, than a, a privilege. So, uh, you know, what's your thoughts on fire and, and how do you build it in your cookers? Well, um, you know, I always uh, when I approached it with just kind of a, uh, a minimalist mentality. My dad actually taught me to build a fire and he always said, man, start out small and grow your fire small and you'll end up with a really even cook. And of course, I knew it all in my 20s and 30s, I would be the guy that literally would throw twigs and sticks and throw a few logs and hit it with lighter fluid and just all the things that you know ruin barbecue. So really, I think the process that gets your your smoker uh, pre-seasoned and ready for meat is just really starting out with shavings. I take a chop saw and make little one-by-one 
splits and whatever I'm using, white oak, post oak, whatever I'm using, I make some splits. I carve out a little bit of wood and just kind of primitively, uh, no pun intended, build me a fire and and then introduce a log. And then once I get the logs going, one of the crucial things is I will really work on a coal bed, sometimes for an hour, hour and a half. Uh, so I'll build a coal bed and get a really good coal bed. So then when I have wood maybe on top of my fire, plus by dryer, it ignites immediately. And that's, I think, real crucial for any of the guys that you go down in tech, central Texas or, you know, any of these guys that are cooking in Carolinas, wherever, that's kind of a, uh, um, I guess, it's somewhat of a, a cheater to, to get your fire going mm -hmm. really good with the coal bed because then everything ignites pretty easy. Yeah. Um, Except for wet wood. Do you... Do you build the fire off to the side or, you know, yours are like a rounded firebox versus the square. So do you lean them up against the one side or the other or do you just build it right in the middle? No, I build it right in the middle. That arch, um, I just did this video blog, the vlog today and tutorials. And I think I mentioned it about the, that Yoder, you know, the rounded bottom. If you take the logs and you put the logs across the bridge of the rounded bottom and then you cross uh, you know, perpendicular to the logs that are sitting there across the bottom, if that makes any sense. Once you get the fire going, you get oxygen and airflow up underneath those coal beds. And I, I like to use the rounded part of the, the firebox to kind of stage and hold up the firewood. The coals will eventually fill in there. And, uh, you know, you can take out the dead coals and sweep them out into a, I got a, a big, huge dustpan and I'll just you know, I'll brush them into that and try to keep just the good active coals there. Um, looking at the clock here, we got about like two and a half minutes. So do we want to talk about beef tallow seasoning or do we want to save that well, for a I different mean, time? You know what? It's I can go through it real quick. I'm going to do a video blog. I'm sorry this is a plug for q -turtles, but, you know, <laughs> I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a vlog here with uh, this uh, tallow that will render down. I've done this. Uh, before and we'll render it down and I'll put it in the spray bottle, the lighter tallow. And that's a great way to season a smoker, especially if, you know, if you've cleaned one, even if you've got one and you pressure wash it off, you get it clean, you can use a lot of the PAM oil, all this peanut oil, whatever. Yep, yep. But that tallow is uh, in the connective tissue, the beef fat. Um, Brendan Lamb is is uh, teaching me some new stuff also about that down in Texas about how to get that really good season on your grates and even in, inside of the smoker, all the firebox to the smokestack. Uh, you want to do lightning round? Well, after what I heard just a minute ago, I better do it. You're damn just, right. Uh, You're damn right. Now give me just, answers and don't pussyfoot around it for crying out loud. I won't. Time. All right, here we go. Uh, let me. Oh, uh, where did I? I just had it here. Hold on one second. Hold on, hold on. Uh, yeah, here we go. Gotta, you gotta have the right music for lightning round. Okay. Crying out loud, you know. All right, here we go. Uh, Domino's or Papa John's? Papa John's. I agree with that. Uh, pepperoni or sausage? Ooh, sausage. Breakfast or dinner? Dinner. Podcasts or radio? Podcast. The truth. Or another's feelings. <laughs> I'm a truth guy. Spatchcock or beer can? Chicken. Beer can. Really? Yeah. All right. Uh, I grew up on this stuff. It's like it's like hominy. You, <laughs> you're, you're around it. You're around it. <laughs> uh, Sazerac or old fashioned? Old fashioned. I have not had one person say Sazerac. That was my favorite drink. Right after I, or right before I started not drinking anymore, but I really got into them. All right, uh, brisket or beef ribs? Brisket. Foil no. or no? No, a brisket's my answer, brisket. but the, the, there's a reason for it. Okay. I can eat it all the time. All right, uh, foil or butcher paper? Butcher paper. Uh, ribeye or the field? Ribeye. In a pan or on the grate? I like both, but I'm going to go with the grate. And finally, open pit or sweet baby race? Open pit. What the hell is wrong with you people? I've asked this question since I, my I, interview with I'm Michael Simon. I'm not the Simon. only one to say open pit. Sweet baby race. No. Is, I'm telling you, the last two and a half weeks that I've been doing lightning round, and it started with Michael Simon, everybody's picked open pit. Am I missing the boat here, JD? 
This, this, I don't the know. stuff I, I, changed. I, got, I, got sweet, I just ate Sweet Baby Ray's, too. That's so if, funny. I just was dipping some Sweet Baby Ray's. If the color fell out of your hat, you could take open pit and recolor it. Like, it's dangerous, it seems. Yeah, it is. I'm trying, but that's, it, it seems like I'm I trying mean, to talk you out of it, but I'm not. I just, I'm surprised that many people are open pit fans. Yeah, I, I mean, I am. Uh, you can find tutorials on YouTube, or what's the best way to find that? Yeah, tutorials, Instagram. I think the Instagram's that uh, the tutorials and Twitter's at tutorials, and um, you know, it's hopefully a tutorial of some type. It's. I hope it doesn't end up being a silly um, like today's, but we have fun. All right. Well, you can find everything you need. Primitivepits.com is the website if you're looking for a, a commercial cooker or something in the backyard they're doing those too it's uh, jd jimmy daniel jimmy always appreciate the time man thanks so much man thank you so much appreciate it you got it there he is mr primitive pit right there All guests talking appear about via the traeger grills cooker, hotline mm -mm -mm. the commercial yeah, aspect uh, how they're able to get their cookers to go he said plus or minus three or four degrees from left right on 12 feet of grate uh, John, I'm just seeing your biscuit test question. I apologize. I'll send him an email, though. I bet he I bet he buys into that. I bet they test that. Matt Frampton and pizza coming up out of the break. I want to talk to you quickly about Cook Shack. They manufacture smoker ovens for barbecue lovers with any amount of experience, whether you backyard barbecue or you do it on the competition circuit or in a five-star dining facility. Cook Shack has the unit that will do the job. And with a full line of barbecue sauces, spices, pellets, and wood chunks, it's the perfect one-stop shop. Cook Shack strives to be your barbecue resource center by offering cooking classes, online recipes, how-to videos, two blogs, smoke and grilling, 101s, and a video cooking classroom. You can check out their website at cookshack.com or follow them on these social media platforms. How about Instagram or Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, even Google Plus? Get advice and share your passion for barbecue on their world-class barbecue forum. Cook Shack pellet-fired smokers are the choice of champions because they were designed by a champion at Fast Eddie Moore and the FEC 100. PG-1000, always customer favorites. The PG-1000 can double as a smoker and a grill. You can do it low and slow. You can do it hot and fast. In essence, the pellet grill line gives you the most for your money. Now, if you don't like pellet cookers, that's fine. Maybe you like electric. Well, did you know that Cook Shack makes the most popular number one rated electric smoker in the industry? They do. High quality means high durability and versatility. Anything you can cook in your oven, you can make in a Cook Shack. Passion and dedication drives Cook Shack's manufacturing, with quality always being at the forefront. Get the best in barbecue since 1962. Call 800-423-0698. That's 800-423-0698. Or visit cookshack.com. Matt Frampton coming up. Stick around. We'll be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Craig Rampey. All right, welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets for all of your pellet-driven cookers. If you are interested in getting some of the best wood pellets that you can possibly get, you want to check out CookinPellets.com. If you would rather buy from one of those real big online stores, Amazon.com sells cookingpellets.com as well. I'm stalling because my Skype is not working this evening very well. Stalling out after each guest. But now I have to find Mr. Frampton. Uh, let's go up to the search here. Type in his name because I know I had him saved in my favorites. but No, it's just not working right now. What can I tell you? All right, uh, who doesn't love a good pizza? Pound for pound pizza, my singular most favorite food on the face of the earth. Even the worst pizza, pretty damn good in my book. And a handful of months ago, Meathead and I uh, talked about pizza on the grill, and that inspired this segment tonight. Joining me now is one of the foremost live fire pizza cooking authorities in the industry, and he happens to be a friend of this show as well. So we will race to the Traeger Grills hotline. 
And welcome back, friend of the show, Matt Frampton. Matt, how are you, buddy? Matt. Oh, oh, oh. Reconnecting. Your connection is poor. What does that mean? All right, let's try this. Matt. Matt. Hey, Greg, how are you, sir? What's up? Oh, uh, not much. Good to see you. Dude, what the hell? Why aren't you wearing the mask? Ah, uh, see, I've got the mask back here on uh, Mike Myers. I couldn't <laughs> decide. Both hats, the red hat, the black hat, they both kind of made my face look pizza. Yeah. Well, so, you know, that's how it is. It's a pizza segment, so, I mean, the, the shirt is off the chain. You got the hat in the back. Lots of different stuff happening, so, I mean, it's uh, it's, it's it's fun. And you're and you're like the the most pizza guy I know. I think, man, it is really blown up since we started talking about it on the show. I don't know; it's been a long time. I know I've been on a few times, but it's been uh, a number of years since the first time. It's getting huge. Matt, can I uh, beg you to call in on the phone because we're getting I'm getting some kind of a hissing in the back, and it's going to make me blow my head off. But are we able to to do that? Yeah, no problem, man. You have the uh, hotline number. Uh, I'll get it from you here right now. All right. Let me send it to you. Uh, all right. Uh, 216-220-0966. Gotcha. On the way. All right. There's just no way I am putting you people through that. There's just no way I'm not doing it. Heidi Ho, neighbor. Hey, how you doing, All sir? Right. Sorry way, about that. Way, way better. Appreciate you doing that for me, Matt. Yeah, no problem. Good so, old Skype problems. Was um was pizza always your jam? And you know, so for the folks that don't know, like I was originally introduced to Matt Frampton through the team Hot Grill on Grill Action. Uh, that was. Were you guys on television? Matt. Yeah, hot grill and grill. Yeah, hot yeah. grill and grill action. Yeah, were you guys on television at one point or or no? Yeah, we were on Barbecue Pitmasters um, yes, that's years right. ago. We started the team in two thousand five, and uh, that was kind of where it all started. But now I kind of have a unquenchable thirst for pizza. All right, so let's first quickly talk about equipment, and especially let's talk about cookers. What have you cooked on, and? Ultimately, what have you found that works best right now? I'm sure there's equipment that's constantly being worked on or being offered into the market that you're probably testing. But what have you find that works best right now? Yeah, you've really got a few choices. And you've got the grilling options, which you can do right on a gas grill or a charcoal grill right on the grate. You've got the pellet options, like the Green Mountain Grill and the Uni. And then you've got a baking option, which you can use an egg or a Primo. I like to use my PK. So you go right on the grill? Yeah, for all of those. Now, I'm a real big fan of the um, higher temps, so 800 plus. Wow. And for those, I'll do um, either on my kettle pizza, which is an insert for the Weber 22. Mm -hmm. Or on the Green Mountain Grill pizza insert, and both of those you can get up into the seven, eight hundred, even nine hundred range if you run it the right way. And with that, you get a uh, anywhere from ninety seconds to uh, a little over two minute bake. All right, so uh, I'll actually talk to you in a couple minutes about where you run temperatures at and all that, because I have my own questions. Because I also have the Green Mountain Grill pizza oven insert, but let's uh, talk now about accessory or ancillary items that you need in order to make a pizza cook successful and these would i guess range anywhere from peels to graters to pizza cutters and things like this i mean obviously it's probably somewhat like barbecue and, and competition barbecue where gadgets all of a sudden out cost everything else that you get into when it comes to pizza making but what are like the key things that you need to have yeah you hit on most of them i'm it's too bad we couldn't do the skype i actually brought props for all this nice but, of course um <laughs> so for you know for building a pizza i like to build a pizza on a wood peel um you have a wood peel option you have a metal peel option mm -hmm. and if you're going to build it on a peel the wood is more forgiving to get the pizza slid on and off so if you don't have 
a wood peel, you're going to be using a lot more cornmeal and flour to try and get it off, and that can be um, dangerous in and of itself. So should you and have, to should you have both? Off, you'd use a metal. I, I would highly recommend having both, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I just bought a metal one, and I, I shied away from the wood one because it didn't seem like... This is going to sound really stupid now that I'm going to say it out loud, but it didn't seem like the wood one was going to get underneath the pizza as well as the thin metal one or aluminum one, but I guess that's not the case as long as you, like, coat that leading edge with your uh, cornmeal or whatever. Yeah, so I have um, out on my website and then on my YouTube channel, you can see how I kind of work different doughs, but what I'll do is I'll build it out on a counter and stretch well i don't build the pizza i stretch the dough on the counter and then i slide it with my two hands onto the peel and then from there i kind of reshape it make it round and then i'll top it right on the peel and you give that thing a shake every you know, through the process so i'll get the dough onto the wood peel give it a little shake to make sure it's sliding around mm -hmm. add some sauce do the same thing top it do the same thing, and then I can usually get that pizza to sit there for a long time and not stick. So you'll have um, pizzas in the chamber, if you will, for lack of a, of a better term, like staged out, uh, and you're not building one at a time and then cooking it and then building another one and cooking it? Yeah, the last couple of years I've, I've staged it out. I mean, my parties and, and get-togethers and such have gotten bigger and bigger, and so... Um, I actually bought a pizza rack uh, locally, but you can get it from the Webstrant store online. I think it's webstrantstore.com. It's like 25 bucks, and it'll hold 50 pizzas stacked vertically. Wow. And the peels fit right in there. And so I'll, I'll get my, all my dough out at once, um, let it rise for a couple hours, and then I stage the dough on peels, and then I build it. And, um, is, you know, when they cook in 90 seconds to two minutes, you can have 15 pizzas sitting there ready to go. And not worry too much about anything spoiling or whatever. When we talk about ingredients, especially dough, and this is probably a segment all in itself, are you a fan of, like for me, I have access to a really great Italian grocer a quarter mile from my house. They make pizza dough balls every day. They're fresh. They're 89 cents. I can get two pizzas to go in the Green Mountain Grill per ball. So, I'm, you know, it's 45 cents for dough for me and then all the other stuff I'm going to put on top of it. I know you make your own dough. Is it a learning process? How much of a time taker is it in order to, to do it right? What are the entry level make your own dough steps? Yeah. So first of all, I'm never going to judge anyone who eats any sort of pizza. Pizza is just awesome in general, but right. as far as dough is concerned, um, time, so similar to how smoke is an ingredient in barbecue, time is an ingredient in dough. So the longer dough has a chance to ferment and build its characteristics, it's actually bacterias and things that are, that are working in there, you get more flavor out of it. So right now, when I make my dough, my favorite aging time is five days in a, in a cold ferment in my fridge. Wow. And um, it is, there is a major difference between a dough, like I always say 24 hours is good, 48 hours is better, 72 hours is is really, really good. Um, right now, I'm tinkering around with five days, and I love it. It's like dry-aging beef. It is. <laughs> it's similar in nature. I mean, there's just things that are happening to that dough that can't happen without time. The yeast is kind of your structure and allowing those gases to build up and, um, and form uh, within the, the gluten, and that the time that's happening in there while it's for, I mean, it's literally fermenting just like a beer and uh, it just gets better and better. You can't get that in a store-bought dough. What do we look for in a flour? I know uh, when I had Meathead on a couple months ago, he was talking about either like a double zero or, or a double odd. I don't know if that's saying the same thing or, um, you know, special Italian flour versus like gold metal flour. What do you need? Yeah, and so uh, double lot and zero zero are the same thing. And what that is is the grind of the flour. That's how that's how fine it's ground down. And the the flour that I like to use is readily available on Amazon. It's hard to find anywhere locally, at least here in Omaha. Mm. It's Antimo Caputo Pizzeria flour. And if you can't find that, I mean, 
a good bread flour, a high a high gluten bread flour, something like King Arthur, their their blue label bread flour. That I mean, I'll use that in a pinch, no problem. But there is a, a again, kind of like the aging of the dough. There's a big difference between how dough feels when it's made with that double zero flour and how it feels when it's not. And all purpose flour is not the right flour for any kind of pizza. So you make the dough in a batch and then like cut it out into the sizes that you want and then start aging at that point, or you just age it as all like one big ball or what do you do? You can do it both ways. Um, I personally make a big batch. I do a very short rest about 30 minutes after I make it. And then I split it individually and I put it in 32 ounce containers that are, they're like to go or like meal prep containers. I put it in those, I oil, oil the dough ball up and stick those in my fridge and then I can take them out one at a time. Do you have to let them heat up? Do you take them out of the, out of the uh, refrigerator after they're doing the cold thing? And then uh, do you want to bring them up to room temperature a number of hours prior? You know, I, I always seem to draw it back to some kind of a meat thing. Like people take their steak out and let it come up to room temperature, like a similar idea or no? Yeah, very very similar idea. I don't I don't take it quite to room temperature. I um, my refrigerator is set at 34 degrees. Uh, when I take them out, I like them to get up around 60. Um, so not quite room temperature. It takes about 90 minutes to do that. That's 60 degrees in the center. It makes it um, much more workable. If you don't let them sit out for an hour and a half or two, you have a, a dough that's tough to stretch. It can tear. Is that a so, rising thing um, when you're letting it come up to room temperature? Does that a rise thing? It rises, yep. It's So the yeast is all activated. Um, it's more alive the warmer it is. Hmm. And so it starts to go dormant when it gets cold in the fridge. It's not dead or anything, but that rise in temperature makes it more active. It comes alive, starts eating the sugars and the flour and the carbohydrates in the flour and... Um, it's putting off a gas to, to create those bubbles. Uh, do you do a double rise with a punch down? I do not. I like to take mine out, let them sit for 90 minutes to a couple hours, and then I set them right on the, the, the work table, and I press from the middle out. I, I'm pretty gentle with it. I like to keep all the air in there if I can and push it all to the edges, and that gives me a nice, uh, a, a nice crust that can get – some air pockets and stuff like that in it. I, I find it incredibly difficult when I have my, uh, you know, ball that I get from the Italian grocer and I, I'll let it sit out for, you know, an hour or whatever, and it gets bigger and it, you know, it's harder to get out of that plastic bag to cut it in half. And then I want to start making my, you know, round dough pie. It is hard to get into a real, good circle is that normal or am i kind of an idiot and be careful what you say now, when, <laughs> when you're taking it out of a bag it's super hard i mean when i put them in the containers there i try and shape them and then um gently get them back out mm -hmm. if the other option you'd have you know if, if you're not making your own and you're just buying it in those bags you could um you know take it out kind of reform it maybe oil it up and let it rest for a little while that way. It's definitely easier to start with a round ball and end up with a round pizza than start with like a, a weird shaped blob and end up with a round pizza. All right, let's talk a little bit about toppings. And uh, I guess, I mean, certainly your creativity is only limited to imagination for what you can put on pizza, but there has to be some uh, semi hard and fast rules by how much of the toppings and sauce and cheese that you're putting on a pizza before it can probably wreak havoc. So what are best practices? Yeah. Okay. So when we're talking wood fired pizza, um, in many cases, less is more. And when you're putting sauce on, as an example, you don't want it super watery. That's going to, that's going to create a, um, just a doughy, crust it's it's not going to be what you want so uh very little sauce and for me my red sauce i'm a big proponent of san marzano tomatoes mm -hmm. you can get them italian certified pretty easily at walmart they make the best tomato sauce on the planet once you eat them you will never go back so 
that's where I stand on the, the red tomatoes. And then the same with cheese. Um, you know, you see a lot of high end, uh, pizzerias use whole milk mozzarella and it's good, but it can get watery. So oftentimes I like to use a 50, 50 blend of a part skim and whole milk mm. just to create a little more structure in there. But again, uh, not too much. So the the big mots fresh mots balls that I'm buying are potentially dangerous then if I'm just using that, or do I want to like set when it I out on those, a tray? No, or yeah, ring you're it talking out? about the like Bellino ones or whatever they are from the store. When yeah. I use that, I'll uh, put that on paper towels and let it dry out for a little while, just because it's hmm. it's so watery. Um, that's just my experience. I recently discovered uh, there is a brand. It's it's not available for retail, but if you know anyone with a distributor, the brand is Grande, and it's the best cheese on planet Earth. Uh, they have a 50-50 <laughs> blend of provolone and part skim mozzarella. It's unbelievable. Really? And the melt's good. Yeah, it's, it's super awesome. So it's Grande cheese. They're out of Wisconsin, uh, of course, and... Uh, <laughs> Really good. All right, let's touch base back on temperatures. And as you had mentioned, um, you like the higher temps. Now, when I do my reads for Green Mountain Grills and I talk about that pizza oven insert most of the time, I say, hey, if you want to run around, you know, 800, 1,000 degrees, you set your cooker to 500 degrees, and typically it's doubled uh, to temperature on the stone in that pizza oven. So you're near 1,000 degrees. And I'm like, hey, you know, I've I've been there. I've tried that a couple of different times, and it seems like it can get out of control like really quick. Obviously, because you're running very hot. I find my wheelhouse to be more in that 650 range. But are there tips to success running that hot? Or I mean, you just got to be on top of it because once it turns, you're kind of screwed. Yeah, I mean, at that temperature, you have very little room for forgiveness. I have. Bad luck on the Green Mountain as well if I set the oven to 500. Mm -hmm. I like setting it to about 300, even 290. And it depends on your model if you've got the Boone or the Bowie and if your fire pot's in the, on the left side or if it's centered. Right. There's a little variance there, but generally like 290 to 310. And the stone will be about 700. And, that, and so that gives you a more forgiving temperature. It, it also, it just rages out of control with ashes all over the place when you have it set all the way at 500 degrees. So as far as the Green Mountain's concerned, that, that's the temperature I run at. On the kettle pizza, um, I just like having a raging fire in the back all the time, and that's usually a eight or 900 degree uh, temperature inside the dome, about 750 or so on the stone. So are you putting it in, and then like 30 seconds later, you pull it out and do a, a 180 on it, or are you constantly... Like in it, wait for 15 seconds and then give it a little bit of a turn, then wait and give it a little bit of a turn. How do you run that? I'm not playing with it very much. So if <laughs> if you can put it in and leave it for 45 seconds to a minute, then turn it around, that's best. Just lets the, the crust, the dough cook better on the bottom. What about resting when the pizza's done? Well, I guess, A, how do you tell when it's done? And then do you do any kind of a, of a rest or anything before you actually cut in and eat? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways to tell when a pizza's done. When And so, again, just kind of focusing on the wood-fired, high heat kind of stuff that we've already been talking about. You're looking for the char. So the char is, in general, how burnt the crust is. And you're, uh, you'll often hear leopard spotting or leoparding. That's little black dots that you'll see on, the, on both the underside of the dough, often called the undercarriage. And then the edge of the dough, if you want the Italian term, it's called cornicioni. Mm, I knew that. And that, yeah, and so uh, that you're looking for those kind of dark leopard spots all the way around the edge. Um, that'll tell you that it's done. And then, of course, if your your topping and your, your cheese is melted, um, then you know. I, I don't let mine rest very long, maybe 15 seconds. I slice it and serve it. What's your favorite pizza right now? What are you making? Oh, man, my favorite pizza is a good sausage and pepperoni pizza mm. with the right kind of cheese and ingredients. I'm a simple pizza eater. But on Saturday night, I had a party, and we made a Thanksgiving leftover pizza that was unbelievable. What was I used um, 
I used uh, the leftover gravy was the sauce. Ooh. I put some turkey on there. I put green bean casserole. I put corn casserole. I put stuffing. And uh, then I put a little bit of cheese just to kind of hold it all together. Cooked it. And then I, uh, after it was done, I topped it with some homemade cool cranberry sauce. And I had my doubts, but the entire party thought it was the best pizza out of 15 we made. Really? Wow. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was very surprised at the reaction to it, and I was very surprised at how wonderful it tasted. I mean, that thing sounds absolutely fantastic. But of course, you are the pizza man. Uh, by the way, Matt, I don't <laughs> want to. I don't want to throw it in your face. But what happened to less is more in that regard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that definitely was. Uh, I was fighting that one for a second. I wondered if I'd even get the thing off the oven, but it came out. Uh, well, it sounds absolutely Somehow. fantastic, no doubt. Uh, so, where can people go if they have pizza questions or they want to uh, get in contact with you for a little bit more expert guidance? Yeah, sounds good. So, I'm at bbqrevolution.com. I'm on YouTube as Pitmaster Matt Frampton, I'm on Instagram as Pitmaster Matt Frampton. You can email me, Matt, at bbqrevolution.com. I'm teaching a class in February here in Omaha, Nebraska, at Helping You Barbecue on uh, Saturday, February 16th. It's an all-day hands-on class where you can – I'm going to show you how I do everything, and then you're going to do it hands-on, get to cook, get to eat uh, your own pizza, and, and I'll cook some of my own and hope to do more of those. But email – Instagram, I'm on Twitter. All that. So any of those. All right. Well, on the show, he is my pizza expert, the official pizza expert of the Barbecue Central show. It's Matt Frampton from bbqrevolution.com. Matt, always appreciate the time, man. Thanks so much for doing it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Talk to you soon, man. You got it. There he is, Matt Frampton, the pizza expert, everybody. That's right. All guests appear via the Traeger Grills Did you hear what he made with the Mm -mm. Thanksgiving Mm -mm. leftovers? Matt, love it. All right, way over, but way worth it. Let me talk to you quickly about the Barbecue Guru, longest-running sponsor of the show. You know, they've always believed that outdoor cooking should be easy because it can be, especially with the Monolith Barbecue Guru Edition Grill. The Monolith is the world's first temperature-controlled smoker with a built-in power draft fan. That means smarter control, greater freedom. With automatic temperature control, easily choose your cooking time and temperature. And let the Monolith do the work of a sous chef or a barbecue pit master with minimal effort. You now have oven-like precision at the grill, and you can serve the tastiest, juiciest meals each and every time. If you have a barbecue guru controller already and you buy a Monolith, you don't need to go buy a new controller. Take that controller... Wire it to the fan, and you are off and running. If you have any questions, give them a call, 800-288-GURU. That's 800-288-GURU. Or you can visit the website, bbqguru.com. That's bbqguru.com. We're back to wrap the first hour. Stick around. I'll be right back. Big name interviews, advice on cooking brisket and ribs, and the only host willing to share his honest opinion on all things important in the world of barbecue. It's the Barbecue Central Show. Welcome back again. Thanks to Matt Frampton from A Hot Grill on Grill Action and his website, bbqrevolution.com, for all of the pizza talk. Let's go ahead and uh, get out. We have the embedded correspondence segment coming up in the second hour, which is already the second hour. And four minutes in. Again, Matt's website, bbqrevolution.com. That's BBQ Revolution. And thanks again to JD, Jimmy Daniel, for talking about Primitive Pits again. Primitivepits.com. Again, uh, he's like seven to eight weeks out. So even on the big ones. They're trying to make that turn time quick. All right, uh, we are real late. I will go back, try to get back on the clock, and then hit the embedded correspondence. You're listening to the Barbecue Central show right here on the Barbecue Central Network. Stick around. We'll be right back. Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. Boing. 
we cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Hit me. Fine, how's it going? You have a great show of a big fan. Boing. So what 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 seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead and he's in the in the crackle. Charbono! It's all about the Charbono, dude! Succulent fish! What? He ate two feet for wiener. So listen, Lavernius, shut the face. Yeah, I'm shaking like a dog shit peach to you. <laughs> we have salt men working on it right now. And just like that, we are into the second hour. You have found the Barbecue Central show, and we talk about barbecue stuff and grilling stuff. Why, just last segment, we talked about pizza stuff that's on your barbecue and or grill. Or maybe you have both, and you do it both ways. I'm trying to figure out how I cut my pinky knuckle hurts really bad. Maybe it was when I was trimming down the rose bush over the weekend. Hit me. Still to come, the embedded correspondence segment in about nine to ten minutes from now. Boy. Doug Scheiding from Texas, Steve Ray from Tennessee, Dave Huff from Oklahoma, and John Solberg, who also creates your best of show from Michigan. Don't forget, you can follow me socially on Instagram and Twitter at BBQ Central Show or Facebook slash bbq central show if you're watching the live feed on facebook thanks for tuning in happy to have you also don't forget that i'm doing a weekly in studio appearance on a real radio show that's the john cupo show again local here in cleveland to be specific willoughby and if you're 20 minutes outside of any direction currently you'll probably be running out of signal as I had mentioned last week, I timed it from when I left the station, Willoughby, till I was getting into downtown. And right about Dead Man's Curve, the signal started to blink out. So, you know, it's a good, what, 20 miles, I guess, ish. So you can find me locally on 101.5 FM or on the AM 1330. It's the same show, just an FM and an AM run. And that usually starts around 0730 each Friday. And I go for about 60 minutes. I think I showed those guys I can provide superior content and entertainment value. And instead of 10 minute appearance to 15 minute appearances turn into now an hour, sometimes longer than that. I'm gonna be hosting that show. I mean, who who's John Kidding? You know I'm coming at it. So I was on this past Friday and the other past four Fridays. There is a talk now about, am I going to put the 1330-101.5 archives in my show feed? But I think a lot of what we talk about is going to be redundant. So while it may be entertaining to a certain degree because you're hearing me as a guest versus a host and asking questions, a lot of the stuff that we're covering, at least right now, is... You know, very 2008, pretty basic stuff. But if you're interested, again, 101.5 and 1330 FM and AM, respectively, here in Cleveland area. And if you are anywhere else, wintradio.com is the website. And you can stream it live every Friday. That's around 730. So be sure to tune in for that. Don't know if you saw this or not, but the award-winning South Carolina barbecue restaurant, Rodney Scott's was damaged by a blaze this past Sunday morning. One of South this coming from the state.com, one of South Carolina's most famous restaurants, tell the customers to follow the smoke to find its award-winning food, but smoke and flames really were visible Sunday when a fire broke out at the downtown Charleston location of Rodney Scott's barbecue, according to the Charleston Fire Department. The late morning blaze damaged the restaurant's smokehouse and the hogs that were being prepped, the fire department reported. It said the fire was recognized shortly after 11 a.m. And four fire departments, along with the Charleston County EMS and Charleston Police Department, responded to help. According to the fire department, restaurant employees were prepping two hogs when they noticed excessive smoke and then fire. They both called 911 after failing to contain with fire extinguishers after responding to the King Street location with flames venting from the roof. 
The fire department said it had the blaze under control in less than 10 minutes. The fire department reported the blaze occurred in the smokehouse, which is separate from the main building, restaurant, and dining hall. While there was damage to the smokehouse roof, equipment, and electrical wiring, no injuries were reported by the fire department. There were at least five customers eating at the restaurant when the fire broke out. They were asked to leave. Post and Courier.com reported the newspaper said that all the meat from the hogs weighing about 175 pounds each were destroyed. Eee. Fire Marshal Division will determine the cause of the fire and its origin. The restaurant owner had its own electrician begin inspecting, removing, and replacing damaged wires in the smokehouse, according to the fire department. Rodney Scott is a James Beard award-winning chef, if you didn't know, and according to the state, named best chef in the Southeast. Known for his whole hog barbecue, Scott's the first African-American to win the Southeast award and the only and only the second barbecue pit master to be recognized by the James Beard Foundation, the state reported. Is that true? I thought Tootsie was, oh, she was in the running for Southeast, but Rodney Scott won. I think Aaron Franklin, obviously, is the only other one, so... There you go. If you were heading down to Rodney Scott's in Charleston, then you're going to want to call first to make sure that uh, things are worked out or maybe they're going to be closed for a little while. But that's a shame. Kind of an iconic or growing to be iconic place. Uh, Rodney Scott, award winning. So there you have it. I was going to talk about Weenie Rub. <laughs> But that'll have to wait until next week. That's a real thing. Weenie rub. I'll be talking about it. In the meantime, let me talk to you quickly about Green Mountain Grills. We were just talking about it with Matt Frampton. In the first hour about the pizza oven inserts that you can get. Those pizza oven inserts, by the way, go in the Jim Bowie and the Daniel Boone alone. Davy Crockett is too small. Will not accommodate. But if you like having the high heat pizza you like being on trend, as they say, then get the Daniel Boone. That's the medium size. Or get the Jim Bowie. That's the biggest one. If you're on the fence about, I, I'm looking at the Daniel Boone, but I, I'm also looking at the Jim Bowie because it's only a couple hundred dollars more. My philosophy is you will always regret not spending the extra couple hundred bucks to get the bigger one. If you have the bigger one, you're typically not going to look and say, oh, I should have saved a couple hundred bucks and got the smaller. You can always justify bigger cooks, right? But you can't cook bigger when you have a smaller cook. Just my two cents. Now, if you're looking for something extremely portable and you want something to take on camping trips or maybe you're headlong into this tailgate season for either college or pro football or both, then the Davy Crockett is just what you need if you don't have access to a traditional power outlet. You can plug it in to your 12 volt outlet in your vehicle, car, truck, van, SUV, or whatever. Also extremely portable, obviously. And the best part is it is fueled by the same wood pellets that fire the Daniel Boone or the Jim Bowie, whether that's a Green Mountain Grill pellet or a cookingpellets.com pellet. Doesn't matter, it eats them all and it eats them very well. And you get to savor the wood fired flavor. So you get it all in one complete and small package. And again, if you get the Jim Bowie or the Danny Boone, I'm highly recommending that you get that pizza oven insert. Even if you're not into pizza, it's something you can grow into very quickly. You can become a master at it very quickly. And it is so much fun. Pizzas for everybody. And they're cooking in two to three minutes tops. I mean, who are you kidding? So good. GreenMountainGrills.com. That's GreenMountainGrills.com. I just had a conversation with Jason Baker last week. He is back from China. Some new things that we're going to be talking about. So stay tuned for that, hopefully coming up at the turn of the year. If it's quicker, we'll do it quicker. But I would say it's going to be some point after the turn of the year. So that'll be Jason Baker when he can do it. In the meantime, Embedded Correspondence segment coming up. Stick around. Be right back. Show giving you a monthly visit from a doctor of barbecue, a man actually named Meathead, the author of a barbecue Bible, bloggers, reviewers, competitors, and manufacturers by the dozens. It's the Barbecue Central Show. 
Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. All right, welcome in. This is the Barbecue Central Show and is being brought to you by Smithfield. Committed Cooks, have you signed up for the 2019 season? There are still spots available. If you head over to the website, smokingwithsmithfield.com, you have the opportunity where if you spend $25, you'll get a number of hundreds of dollars of free swag and gear and promotional items from Smithfield. So do me a solid and head over there. Also, if you're going to be competing with Smithfield products, you want to make sure you go over there and register as well so you can take advantage of all those incentivized. Uh, If you come in first in pork or ribs or whatever, you can list it there and get free prizes as well. That's smokingwithsmithfield.com. All right, this is the fourth Tuesday of the month. You know what that means? It's the Embedded Correspondence Segment. Of course, getting the woot woot sign from David Huff, John... Solberg is there. Steve Ray is in. Let me unmute you guys so we can make sure we hear it. Uh, let me throw this out, guys. If possible, if you're not talking, uh, make sure you mute yourselves so we can give proper respect to whoever is talking at the moment. Not pointing that out to anybody in specific, just making a general statement. If you could possibly do that for me. <laughs> so uh, here's what's going on for the embedded correspondence this segment. Uh, and by the way, uh, while he has filled in in the past, I do want to re-welcome in John Solberg. He is at your bottom left corner there as you're looking at it from Michigan. Um, this is the time of year, folks. So uh, Thanksgiving is now past. We can easily say we are headlong into the holiday season. That's going to be gift buying and get me these gifts. And why not have the Barbecue Central Show Embedded Correspondence get into this whole Embedded Correspondence top 10 gift list or thereabouts, then we can also argue with each other about if that's a good idea or if it's not a good idea. Also, aside from things that we think everybody should have, if you've also generated some things that maybe you want, we can talk about those, or things you don't want, And nobody should get because they're blasphemy, like 10th circle of hell type items. And we don't want to have those. And we want to make sure nobody's getting those to be made to feel inferior for a number of months on end. So uh, he's here this month helping us out. John Solberg from Michigan. John, I know you specifically wanted to talk about one particular item. And I know we have debate that will be running rampant, at least with one other embedded correspondent. So, John, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I only have one thing on my do not buy list for this season, and that is a meter. Really? Meter block, meter probe, meter <laughs> anything. No meter. <laughs> no meter. We're going vegetarian on the meter. The meter is a wireless remote probe it was made to go in your cooker yep. i have noticed it, it it is on someone's wish list so I, I just wanted to get in front of this and try to try to cut this off at the pass all right so why don't you like the meter what are you finding to be uh, a, a put off for you well the the meter is an american tragedy um in, in 2015 <laughs> this company went to crowdfunding yeah and in two months, they raised four million dollars to produce this product. Wow! Four million dollars, and it's 2018. Where is the product? It's still not here. It doesn't exist. They have a probe, but they forgot the block, the charger, the relay. As it is, why is this even still a, even a topic of discussion? I mean, John, it could be because people are so excited to get what they perceive to be as this product that is going to change their life that they will continue to wait and continue to fund something that has millions upon millions of dollars. And I say, hey, if you want to be sheep, be sheep. It's like the same assholes that buy iPhones. I mean, give me a break. No offense to anybody that's got iPhones, by the way. Uh oh. So. <laughs> John, so, like, do you have one, or did you put in for order, and you've been scorned, or what? No, I've learned my lesson with crowdfunding a long time ago. I've been burned Uh a few times. I'm not going to be the first guy at the party. I'll let all you guys fund it. Once it works out, I'll pay 20 bucks more, and I'll get it. I think the meter is a great concept. Sure. Um, My whole theory is, though, if, if I came up with the meter concept 
and you gave me four million dollars, I wouldn't deliver it either. I would be done. I would. So, and that's where this thing's going to go. Um, you know, I think even Meathead has made it a do not buy based on this shenanigans of the meter company. All right now, I'm going to flip it right over to my homeboy and longest running embedded correspondent, Doug Shiding from Texas, who I believe has some semblance of a meter. So I'm anxious to get Doug's take on John's take, and then we can run from there. I am actually in John's corner. The reason it is number one <laughs> on the stuff I want or need is because I freaking paid for it a year and a half ago. Uh, wait, I thought I you had it. I thought you had it. No, I've got the meter probes. I've got two of the stinking meter probes that are cumbersome to use let's say at best and have has a uh, you know 10 foot without the wireless you know it, it, they they've been a complete waste of money so for the, the most part the block is the item that would really put this meeting yes. thing into the stratosphere would make it a winning project Correct. Yeah. The meter probe, you need to have another, let's say, tablet with a hot spot or something next to the grill because it only has about a 10 foot radius, mm. um, uh, you know, from a Bluetooth standpoint. As soon as you close the grill, you can't get the t temperature really. But it, you have to have another hot spot right next to the grill in order for the meter to really run, run off of, you know, on your phone and you can, you know, be in the house while, while it's running. But, but the block is supposed to cover this. Well, according to Dennis Busso in Instant Chat, the block is shipping in December. <laughs> All right. Gang, here, here we go. go. Here we go. Embedded Correspondence Pool. Steve Ray, for $10, do you believe that the meter block will be shipping in December? Yes or no? No. Uh, Doug, do you believe the meter block will be shipping in December? Yes or no? Absolutely no. Absolutely no. David Huff, your thoughts? Uh, I guess I'll go with yes and take the $10. This guy is some kind of shithead. Uh, John Solberg, do you believe that the block will be shipping in December? No, never for eternity. It will never, ever ship. <laughs> All right, guys, I didn't want to do this, but here we go again for another quick lightning round of answers. Which will ship first? Here we go. The Meter Butcher Block or Meathead's new book? Wow. Steve Ray, your thoughts? Uh, the, the next coming of Jesus Christ, probably. <laughs> uh, I'd say... Um, the, oh, gosh. Remember, the Meathead's meter, book is projected meter, 2020 at this point. The meter, the meter block. The meter block will come. Wow. Uh, Doug Shiding, Meathead's book or the meter... Or the, oh, jeez. Or the meter block. Since I paid for it a year and a half ago, <laughs> I pray it's the meter block. All right. But what do you think is going to happen? The block. All right. Uh, David Huff, meter block or Meathead's book? The block. John Solberg, you have the last word. <laughs> Meathead's book or the meter block? Meat, a Meathead's book will be in my hand way before I Doug agree. gets that block. By the way, I totally agree. <laughs> John Solberg is 100% right on that. Uh, John, do you have any other like top 10 list or anything, or were you just looking to rant on the meter block? Oh, I'm trying to protect folks from this meter block thing, and, and then Doug, he's got it on his wish list. So uh, honestly, for my top 10 list, I'm a very humble guy. So if uh, quickly, give me a roll of aluminum foil. Give me a box of kosher salt. Mm. You know, give me some string knit gloves, some nitro gloves. I'm a happy guy. There's nothing else I need. All right, then uh, that's it for John. John, beat it. Thank you for coming in. Well, wow. so, uh, I mean, do you feel, um, Doug, that you are going to take John's advice uh, here? Wait, wait, you've paid and you're just waiting. That's right. right? I've paid. That's yeah, okay. why I want yeah. it. That's why it's number one on stuff I want. I paid for right. it. Right. So John is late is what we're saying. John, I'm sorry. Where were you? How long have you paid for this now? I think it was a year and a half ago. Oh, I'm afraid to go back and look. Sweet Lord, a year and a half. John, where were you a year and a half ago? John is all up on crowdfunding. I thought crowdfunding was legit. I didn't know you could raise $4 million and then disappear. I mean, I think we got to get together and figure out something we could source out and then just disappear with all the money. <laughs> Forget it. Uh, Steve, we have uh, 10 minutes left in this segment. So why don't we start with you in regards to... Items that you think everybody should have 
or oh. maybe people are getting into the barbecue and grilling industry and this is the first uh, you holiday got, season. You guys think so what? small. What are you talking about? Christmas gifts are things that you would never buy yourself. <laughs> I mean, you, you know. What are you talking about? Foil, aluminum foil, rubber gloves. That's John. Uh, here's my here's my list. Number one. All right. Gift certificate to Darren Wars Barbecue School. No such thing. Go ahead. There's the point. Everybody's got a price, Greg. I don't think okay. Darren has any price. I, I, Darren yes, works on his Darren, own hey, schedule. Darren's got a price. No. And he says, Steve, I'll teach you for 5000 Doug, pony up. That's my price. All right. A jambo pit. Okay. Jambo. I want entry into the king of the smoker barbecue contest. That's this weekend, <laughs> Sterling Ball. Yes, that's right. I knew There's that. There's still time. It's only Tuesday. I could be in Southern California. If you got the invite tomorrow, you would make I, the trip I out? I could be there. I could be there. Really? I can go from here to Atlanta to California. I heard there's, <laughs> I heard there's a number of different ways to get to Chicago. Flies. Exactly. I want 10 cases of Snake River Farms Wagyu brisket handpicked by Darren Ward. I see a crush going on. He's got them already. He's already got them in his house. He's already handpicked them. We right. just ship them down here. I want a gift certificate to Tuffy Stone's Barbecue School. I want an old Hickory 750. I want a new RV modified for competition barbecue with built-in Cambros, stainless steel kitchen, and framed recipes on the wall of all four proteins in KCBS. Written by Darren Ward. Oh, my Lord. I, I want a set of Colteri Birdie ox-handled knives because mine are getting a little dull. I don't know what Colteri is. Is that, a, is that a name brand that everybody should know? Look it up. All right. Okay. It, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good Is that knife. something that Darren Worth uses, Steve? He probably does. I bet. I, I want 150 John Boo's 36 by 36 walnut cutting boards. So I can just throw them away after I use them. They'll be the new disposable <laughs> cutting boards for Al's Nest Barbecue. And I want a gift certificate to David Bosca's Barbecue School. All right, so two of those could actually happen. You could, uh, I think Dave Bosca does put on a barbecue school from time to time, or he has I in the past. I think you're really uh, setting yourself up for heartache with Darren Wars because, I, I mean, for as much as he so. has won over literally the decades, and he has never put on one class... We're Short, friends on Facebook. I, understandably so, but nevertheless, <laughs> I you know do I not believe. You know what I don't want? Yeah, uh, yes. You see this? What you is see that? This? Is that a you sombrero? That That's a sombrero. You know what that is? That's a plate. Okay. okay. That plate, you take it to a party, you put your drink like that, and you can put your food around it. Are you sure got, that's not a, a chip and I dip thing? I think, yeah, you, no, I think no, you're no, no, no. I think you're way off. I think you're way off. No, no, no. This was like that. And then you put food around it. Are you sure? How did I, how did I live no. without that? Wow. No. You know what else I don't want? No. I don't want another one of these. <laughs> the big spatula. You open that up Christmas morning, and the only person that laughs is the guy that gave it to you. <laughs> the big spatula. Okay? I don't want any more of these, folks. Don't want any more big spatulas. And there's one more thing I don't want. Okay. I'll take that. Steve. See, I want that. What is that? Ki it is Kyocera. Sounds very, very, very eloquent, doesn't it? Kyocera is actually the correct pronunciation, but I don't want to be that guy. You probably have these. You probably have a whole <laughs> set of them. That's a ceramic knife. Oh. You know how useless that thing is? How useless? You know what? Somebody... Somebody broke the ceramic cow in a nativity scene and cut themselves one time, and they said, boy, that's pretty sharp. I think I'll make a knife out of that. You think that's They're, how that industry was started? You know how many of these things I've got? People give me those. I've got a hundred. Steve, are the people that are giving you ceramic knives the same guys that are giving you the big spatulas and laughing you yeah, twice at yeah. Christmas? And the, and the other ceramic knives, they come in color. They've got green, they're pink, purple. Wow. No more ceramic knives. And you know what else I don't want? I don't want any more of those stupid T-shirts that say, kiss the barbecue cook or barbecue king. I don't want 
a DVD set of the Barbecue Pitmaster series. I've already got that. I don't want any more <laughs> super burn charcoal from Big Lots that you couldn't light with a jet engine. These are things that I don't want. And you know what else I don't want, Doug? I don't want any more ceramic knives. Okay? I think that was made. No ceramic knives. That was very eloquently put uh, five minutes ago. Uh, Steve, from a uh, suggestions standpoint, are there a few items that you think people just getting into barbecue should be asking for or that the gift giver should be thinking about? Sure. A barbecue pit. Why should I have to buy it? Give a, if, if you have a friend that wants a barbecue, <laughs> buy him a pit. Buy him a, what are those things you sell, Doug? Traeger? Buy him a Traeger. <laughs> Give him a Traeger. Say, by golly, that's a gift. David, what Thank do you, you like about... Don't go, don't go down to Lowe's and get that, what's that, Oklahoma Dan's thing or that they sell down there that's $149. Don't get him that. Get him a Traeger. Get him something he can cook on. David, what do you like or dislike <laughs> about uh, Steve's lists? Why does the Oklahoma whatever have to be the crap things? I mean, oh. what's wrong with you, Steve? Oh. Um, I'll tell you what I don't like. Steve, there oh. is. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Hey. Uh-oh. Look. Malfunction. There is there's nothing wrong. I like pig butts, and I cannot lie. Yeah. It's a you perfect know, shirt. I was, I, just, that one I was just going to say is I like pig butts, and I cannot lie okay, but evidently not. I can't spell sausages without USA. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that one either. Oh, God. And do, you, then, do you wear that shirt? Absolutely. Look, smoke them if you got them. <laughs> pig, cow pig chicken. Look. Guys, it's my wardrobe. It's better than those floral Hawaiian crap that Steve usually wears on the show. <laughs> I don't understand. Floral Hawaiian crap. <laughs> wow. I want some of those. You can buy me some of those. Doug, um, <laughs> Doug, do you have thoughts on Steve's lists? Well, the, actually, that big spatula, I would kind of like to have that big one. <laughs> okay. you can just, I'll send you my shipping address, and you can send that baby to me. I'm going to tell you, you where that spatula came from because I have one. That's a pizza spatula, isn't it, Steve? Exactly. Don't lie. That's right. what I would want to use it for. No idea. Oh, bullshit. You know, that came with a pizza stone and that spatula. I had the same kit. That thing folds down into itself, doesn't it? Uh, I, Steve I got that at Christie's toy box. That's what happened. Don't lie. I have, I've got no idea. I don't. I don't even have a pizza stone. If you if you move oh. that uh, that collar, that thing will fold right up. Move that collar back. Yeah. Now fold it. That's there you big. go. Look at that. Oh, that's what oh, I'm my talking goodness. about. <laughs> I'm telling you, I have the same thing. It's a pizza spatula. Now he wants it. He really likes it. Now. Now yeah, it's, it's the best thing ever. Too. I didn't know I could take it to the World Food Championships this season. I'm going to take it next year. You probably got ceramic knives and T-shirts. Yeah, right. Well, uh, all right, David, let's start with your list. Uh, we'll have to break here in about a minute and a half. But let's talk about uh, wish list items that you're recommending for folks to get other people this year. Sure. Now, I'm somewhere in between Steve's large requests and the humbleness of, of John. Um, I think you absolutely have to start with a thermopin. If you don't have a, a good thermometer, it's, it's critical for any backyard barbecue or competition guy for that matter. A um, couple items that might not be traditional and might be uh, anti-barbecue, uh, Instapot and a sous vide. Um, I just made pork carnitas tonight with the Instapot, and I made them in about an hour and 10 minutes and uh, finished them under the broiler, and they were delicious. So try getting a pork butt tender in an hour and 10 minutes with anything besides a pressure cooker. And the sous vide, even if you're not cooking with it, I'll tell you what, Greg, I've started to reheat my briskets and pork butts mm. using the sous vide. Um, fill your smoker up when you smoke. Um, don't waste it get all the briskets you can get in there, vacuum seal them and freeze them. And if you warm them up in the sous vide, they don't dry out. It slowly warms them up to the temperature you want. And that alone is worth getting a sous vide in my opinion. All right, David, uh, stand by just for one second uh, while we yep. do a little business here and then we'll come back so you can finish out your list. Uh, Doug will go next. I'll go after Doug. See what's happening after that. Attention anybody who really likes 
the business of barbecue. I know all my embedded correspondents do. You know a little bit about Southside Market Barbecue, right? Fans of this show, supporters of this show, established in 1882, Southside Market Barbecue, the oldest barbecue joint in Texas, and they've been owned and operated by the same family for three generations. They offer premium Central Texas barbecue products, slow smoked over real wood, shipping, distributing, and manufacturing sausages for companies across the U.S., from food trucks to multi-chain restaurants, Southside Sausage can be on your menu too. All meats are processed in their on-site USDA inspected facility. A trusted partner with a focus on quality and authenticity. Bless you, Steve. Wholesale options available. Shipping nationwide via FedEx. Food service distribution via Cisco. U.S. Food and Martin Food, some of the biggest players in that game. Co-packaging capable from research and development to package completion. We can follow your recipes or help you develop something brand new from scratch. Private label opportunities also available. Visit SouthsideMarket.com for more information. So here's the deal. If you go to SouthsideMarket.com and you do all of your shopping, put everything in the cart and it's ready to ship, there's going to be a part for a promo code. Use promo code BBQ Central, all lowercase letters, BBQ Central. You get 10% off your entire order when you go to southsidemarket.com. Only available for online listeners and podcasters. Doesn't go anywhere else, so you're special. Take advantage of that today. It's good folks over at Southside Market and Barbecue. We are back with more Embedded Correspondence right after this. Stick around. Be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Craig Rampey. This segment brought to you by Fireboard. Monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect to Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring or connect via the Bluetooth. And if you have Alexa or the Google Assistant in your home, you're luck because Fireboard, fully integrated with both and constantly learning new skills. You can find out more by visiting fireboard.com or call 816-945-2232. Good folks at Fireboard. All right, David, uh, go ahead and continue with your gifts. Sure. Um, I agree you definitely want a good set of knives. Um, whatever that may be, depending on price range, but you want a boning knife, curved if possible, a chef knife, a slicer, and uh, I prefer a cleaver in there as well. Um, vacuum sealer, if you don't have one, again, with the theory of fill up your smoker when you use it and be able to save the, save the volume of meat for a later date. Um, you know, for some reason on my list, I suddenly wanted a limited edition butcher barbecue crate from owl's nest barbecue it just hit me out of nowhere that i decided that's what i wanted huh. um i know strange and then i know uh, a guy I, I don't either and then to go along with uh any good barbecue <laughs> for my friends out there that really really love me please get me a bottle of pappy van winkle's bourbon uh, now, to, there's a number of different levels, so you got to be a yeah. little bit more specific depending on your good friends, or maybe they're not so good. Don't care. They can get the, the lowest level one if they want, because I think that's still going to run them about a grand right now. So. No, no way. Yeah, Pappy Van Winkles? No, no not the lowest level. No, no, no. Are you not sure? The lowest. Yes, of yes. course. Okay. I, mean, yeah. well, I, used to buy, I used to buy them for $90 about six years ago for the lowest level. And even that, last time I saw that was $350, $400. Yeah, I think that the 25 year is going to be in that $2,500 range, maybe. I think is 25 the oldest. I think that's the most expensive bottle. But I think the lower end is way less expensive than that. Well, I'll take them all. Doesn't oh, matter. To I've me. got a couple I'll sell you for 1000 each or you will <laughs> uh, i'd rather buy a meter if that's the case um yeah, but you'll get I'd the say, bourbon yeah that's that's true um and if i'm really going to go extravagant um you know i've been pretty happy with my my yoder um i had the 1500 and they now have the cimarron model which is the bigger one um and they have that uh now available on a a custom trailer uh, pull behind uh, with a vehicle. Um, I saw a rig where they've got two of them back to back. I'd I'd love to have that to take to to competitions, but if not, I'll settle I'll settle for a, a little Traeger tailgater so I can take it camping with me. 
All right, Doug Shiding from Texas is up next with his tools everyone must have. And I'm very excited to hear this list. So go ahead, Doug. Okay, well, I broke mine into several several categories. Okay. The first one, taking Steve's lead, I actually bought my father a uh, Traeger. And I, he's been a grill guy, and he came to my barbecue class that I taught and everything, gave him the grill for Father's Day and everything. He loves it. So uh, I would say a Traeger Timberline or uh, I actually got him a Pro 22 and he's he is a convert of uh, from the grill uh, gas grill. So uh, Steve, this is hold, great. Or, I'm sorry, Doug, hold on one sec. How long have you been barbecue? Uh, about 10, 11 years. Why? He's, he's just catching on now. They're he, not real close. He didn't want to <laughs> he didn't want to he didn't want to broach low and slow. He was just a grill guy. He was, he's always been a grill guy, really? always been a grill guy. Wow. And so here's a testament. He, my, he did steaks on the Traeger and my mom normally can't eat the steaks and she was, they were so tender. She was able to eat the steaks really? coming off the Traeger. Yes. Right. Yes. Did she have teeth? And, <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not from Tennessee. Thank you. <laughs> the, 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 ooh. Hey, I your steak. <laughs> Does your dad grill hot dogs on the Traeger? Uh, no, yeah, no, not yet. Thank you. He <laughs> even did a he even did a turkey. So, all right. So this is great. So now I've you know for someone that's hard to buy for, um, like myself, I have got all of these things that I can buy for my dad. So I actually my number one is a thermopin. I actually bought him a thermo thermopop. Uh, so we'll we'll uh, see how that works. But um, you know. Don't be like I am because I'm an ad antagonist. I had the Taylor, you know, and I thought this was the coolest thing. The Thermopin MK4 is fantastic. Yep. It works. I mean, it's got the backlight. It's it's fantastic. Don't play around. Just get, you know, the Xerox of, of the Thermopin. Um, my second item is the barbecue tool of the year. And the, again, this, these are things that everyone needs to have. The Chops Power Injector. I use it all the time. The only thing I, I think I don't use it on is um, chicken. Otherwise, I use that thing when I'm doing one brisket or I'm doing two briskets or I'm doing four briskets. I use the Chops Power Injector. I also recommend the Gun Injector um, for chicken and 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 other you know smaller birds, pheasant, you know duck, whatever. So, thirdly, Doug. I call these my NASA hot gloves. These things are awesome. Maybe it should be NASA cold gloves, but they're more like the CDC, you know, when you're handling, you know, biochemicals and things like this. But uh, these things are fantastic. Um, I think they're far superior to the hot gloves that you put, you know, the little the little cotton the gloves cotton that you put underneath your nitro gloves. Um, I think they're much superior to those. Now, I hate tongs. Tongs are terrible. Tongs take off the rub off your meat. So my, I say use these pigtails, these small little pigtails. Greg, you're laughing. This is I mean, this it's, is a it's, it's easily the worst advice you've ever given on the show. I mean, you no, got to be kidding. This, have you? I I picked up a nine pound pork rib rack this weekend with two of these things. Doug, put on your I freaking met... hot gloves and pick up the thing. You're not going to ruin the rub. Use your hot glove, big tail. Are you yeah, kidding? No. I, I'm I'm maniacal pig about tail. not not touching the the upper surface of the uh, and and doing steaks. This is the only way to do it. Don't don't use tongs. Throw the tongs away and get pigtails. Get two of these. You can get two of the small ones. And get one of the large ones. When you're cooking chicken, you know, whole chickens, you can use the big pigtails and they're perfect. I got this one is, of those for Christmas and it's never came out of the box, Doug. I, I don't understand. This one? Yeah. <laughs> send it to me. Yeah, send, Steve. I'll trade send, you for the Pappy Van Winkles. Steve, are you a, are you a pigtailer, Steve? I've got one. I don't use it. Uh -huh. I, I just... This is the most underutilized tool, barbecue oh, tool, in one one hundred percent. You know, no kidding. You know why? <laughs> There's a reason for that. <laughs> All right, continue, Doug. Okay. Don't yeah, don't play around. You know, it may maybe if you got a you know Arctic or Yeti, you can use a, a cooler to to keep your meat in warm. Just buy a stinking Cambro. 
you know, and buy the ones with the three pans and buy the real pans. Don't fool around with the aluminum foil pans. Just buy the stinking uh, steel pans and put them in there. Hmm. They're fantastic. I don't use uh, hardly at all any of the the aluminum pans anymore. I just oh. use those steel pans, whether they're the half pans or the, the the steel pans. It's been one of the best investments I've ever I've ever done. <laughs> and I actually use two. So like at a, at, a, at a contest or whatever, I've got one that's cold and one that's hot. And then by the time I need both of them for hot, I'm done with the cold. So um, don't play around. Just buy them. Heck, you can probably find them on, on Craigslist or something. Uh, I'm with you. Good knives. Steve, I, I, I didn't know your, uh, your, your level of knives. Those, those are some expensive ones. But um, um, I'm not a Cutco fan. I, it doesn't feel good in your hand. I think it needs to have a thicker uh, on, on the handle side, so I, I'm not a Cutco fan. Um, although I do like the Cutco shears, but other than that, I have wolf knives from Tahoe Kitchen. They're fantastic. There's only one way to reverse sear, and that's using a griddle or cast iron skillet. Mm -hmm. you, I don't think you know you can really reverse sear because you're looking for the overall browning or caramelization, et cetera. Right. You're only gonna get that. that if you put a griddle, you know, if you're doing more than two steaks, two steaks, you can do it in a cast iron pan um, uh, skillet. But if you've got more than two steaks, you need a griddle or better yet, two griddles. So I have I have actually three. So uh, just depending on how many I'm doing at one time. Smoke tube. So, yes, as a, uh, used to use these in, in the older Traeger models, you know, just to get more smoke. But I actually use these now mainly for cold smoking food what so is, like if i'm hold that up it, what is that that's the amazing that is, tube what yeah, do you do this you you fill it up with pellets and uh, you know you can fill it up to about 90 percent. you put it down and then use a little propane torch on the end and and it'll smoke for about three to four hours oh and, the incense thing yeah, yeah, if, yeah, exactly. So, but your grill's not on if you want a cold smoke. So if you want a cold smoke cheese, I mean, we cold smoked uh, limeade and made fantastic mojitos. You can do all kinds of stuff with this. Now, if you've got a charcoal grill, you know, and, you're, and you want to add some, some wood smoky flavor on a charcoal grill, like a Weber or something like that, you can put this on there too, or a, you know, big green egg or whatever. So you, you can use pellets, this. Like, like, like in a trigger, pellet. Little pellets, yeah, bar, you know, Traeger, Traeger pellets, or you know, whatever flavor right. you like, and this will go three to four hours. Wow, I've never seen that. Yeah, cooking oh, this thing, cooking thing, I've, seen that thing. I've never seen. Cookingpellets.com has them for sale on their website, by the way. Okay. They do. Yeah, do you have one, this one? I Greg, do have one. Yes, I do. Do you use it, Greg? Uh, not a terrible amount because we're not a big cold smoke family, but. If I need to inject a like in the in the Green Mountain Grills, if I want an extra smoky flavor, then I'll fire one up and you know use it like you were using in your Traegers, your old Traegers, sir, Doug. Yeah, my old Traegers. Yeah. So with the Timberline, I don't need it, but right. uh, but you know because it has the super smoke and and I don't need it. But with the older the older uh, pellet grills, uh, this is fantastic. Oh yeah, it works like, great. Cold. Works great. Yeah, and if you know, like I say, if you've got a charcoal grill, this is perfect too. If you want to add some wood wood, because uh, I, I don't like the uh, oak charcoal and those sort of, you know just give me charcoal and let me let me use uh pellets or or chips to get mm -hmm. the the smoke flavor david uh, have one i do and i use it when i'm cooking stuff on my natural gas grill i use it to have a little bit of smoke flavor i'm the oh only, that would be good i'm the only one that have one well not to make you feel bad steve but you what also had started. no idea that DivaQ had been on the show before so, no surprise <laughs> continue Doug. <laughs> okay, thanks. And the last thing, and this is, you know, just for the general uh, spot, you know, Meathead, Meathead's book, you know, if if someone is new or getting into barbecue, etc., they need to have Meathead's book. So that's that's my number 10 item. All right. What do you want? Okay. Well, as everyone, you know, as, as I was called out in the beginning, I want my meter block that I paid, you know, I, I actually think I paid almost hundred and fifty, hundred and seventy-five dollars for that stinking thing, and I'm I'm out of my money. So, um, a nice thing would be is a custom knife roll. 
I would like a custom knife roll. I think, think that would be a good gift for a, for a barbecue person. Adrian Miller's books. That's yes, I know. I do read books when I go on vacation. Nothing wrong I with would that. like Adrian Miller's books. Um, I would also like Tuffy Stone book. I haven't, I don't have that one yet. Um, and last but not least, I'm not going to go into the freaky, you know, past 50 days and, you know, based on Lafrida's uh, segment, you know, a few, few times ago or Snake River Farms. I would like a 45 day age steak. I do not uh, think I'm going to get into the, I just, you know, little pinky toe in the, in the, in the pool. What don't you want? I don't want. You know, kind of like Steve, I don't want any random barbecue rubs, including bacon saw. I don't want any barbecue sauces. And uh, David, I think you were going to say this is this barbecue sauce of them. I do. I don't want any any barbecue sauce that I don't buy myself. I also don't want. You know, at Academy, they've got the barbecue, big barbecue fork with the temperature gauge and the, you know, and the tip and, and, you know, the big tongs. I don't like tongs. I definitely don't like big tongs. And I don't like big spatulas unless it's Steve's that's for a pizza. I don't want to see any more pictures of people squeezing meat or slicing brisket. Just yesterday, I saw someone, you know, a brisket is kind of rectangular and they cut it, you know, on the short side, like that was the right way to cook a brisket. I don't want to see any more pictures like that. Someone else, I think had said this, I don't want any more aprons. I've got so many aprons. I only wear one. I've got a leather Traeger one. I don't need any more. And of course, last but not least, I do not want any hot dogs for any of my kids. <laughs> friends. We are I'm staying sorry. with the anti-hot dog movement going into 2019. I appreciate Doug's stick to on that. I'm doubling down, tripling down. No doubt. All right. Uh, quickly, I will give you my list. These are gifts that I would suggest for people to buy other people getting into this. Uh, Weber Smoky Mountain for the beginner. I think uh, bang for the buck. Can't get a more easy set it and forget it kind of cooker. You don't need a lot of extra. You can buy a lot of extra crap for it, but you don't need a lot of extra crap for it to learn how to manage a fire and make a really good product after you learn how to light it, of course, using the Minion method. But I think Weber Smoky Mountain is good. A Weber gas grill or a kettle grill or both. I'm a big proponent of having multiple cooking vessels on your patio or backyard because, as you will find, you can use everything for something. And there's nothing cooler than having all of your grills and smokers fired up for a party and everybody thinks you're really cool. So that's kind of an added benefit. I agree with everybody else that you've got to get a Thermapen from Thermaworks, whether it's the Classic or the MK4, no doubt about it. Hand in hand with if you are getting into barbecue, you have to get a vacuum sealer. I will double up and uh, confirm David Huff's belief in that. That was the first thing that somebody told me after I learned how to light my Weber Smoky Mountain like 12 years ago was go out and get a uh, food saver. That was the brand that I've had for a number of years and Mm -hmm. um, I have to tell you that that changed my barbecue life from trying to figure out how we were going to eat all of this brisket or all of this pork butt over the next handful of days before it went bad. Now you could just cook it and fill it up, like David said, and use the vacuum sealer to save it all, and it stays good for years on end in the freezer. Hot gloves, uh, echoing Doug's sentiment, of course. I agree with a boning chef and slicing knife. Not too big on a cleaver myself, but a boning chef and a slicing knife uh, of a of a decent quality. I don't have any name brands that I can quickly throw out to you, but uh, any of my embedded correspondents will be able to guide you in the right direction if you have any questions. I think if you have a grill, you have to have a set of grill grates. I think these are life-changing products. It's not just because they're really popular in the State Cook-Off Association. I've been a big fan of theirs for Eight years, nine years, every grill that I get, I take out the grill grates to come with it, and I retrofit with grill grates because uh, I like the way they perform. I like, I do believe that they even out heat. They do make cook hotter, so you do have to adjust a little bit on your uh, on your thermostat on where you want it to cook. But you can flip the grill grates over, and now you have a griddle option. Doug was talking about a griddle in his segment. Uh, I, I, you can. My grill is set up half on rails and half flat for the grill effect. And I think you, it's, it's a great setup that way. If you have a Green Mountain Grill, I highly suggest you get the pizza oven insert. It's a must have. And again, agreeing with David, absolutely get a sous vide machine apparatus, whether it's like a bread machine looking thing like I have from a company called sous vide, sous vide Supreme, I think, 
or one of those things you hang off of some type of water holding apparatus and then set it to the temperature and eventually it, it gets it up there. So those are the things I think you need to have or that you should be getting somebody getting into barbecue and grilling. My wish list in no particular order. Up in. I want a custom grill works setup on my backyard from that grill grill works Ben guy. I mean, is anybody familiar with these grill works setups? No? Oh my god. Just just Google grill works and then you will also be wanting one. That might actually leapfrog number one on your things, uh, your list of things you want, Steve, if you haven't checked this thing out. But grill works setup, definitely want one outdoor of those. Kitchen, outdoor kitchen thing? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um John, I want a John Patty JP Custom Smoke Cooker. This would be something that I guess would be akin to a Jamie Gear Jambo Pit, but I like uh, John Patty's look. It's absolutely sexy cooker. I want a load of 70-day dry-aged ribeye steaks from Pat LaFrida because I want all of the funk. I don't want to dip my toe in the funk. I want to jump head first and break my neck in the funk. I want a real <laughs> Cambro as well. I want a big standalone dry-aging locker for beef. In case I want to do my own dry aging at home. I want dinner at Prime and Proper Steakhouse in Detroit. I don't think you'll ever hear me say I want to go to Detroit, but other than go to Prime and Proper Steakhouse because it's an absolute fantasy of mine as I follow them on social media. I want to cook barbecue with Sterling Ball once. I want 10,000 Instagram followers. And most importantly, I want an embedded correspondence meetup at some point. Uh, that, of course, would also include John. Don't get me a freaking apron ever. I won't wear it. Trash. Ever. You don't wear an apron no. ever? No. Not even a I have, meat or anything? I have 75,000 barbecue t-shirts. I have all the aprons I need. I wear the t-shirts. I wipe my hands on my shirts. And if I can't get the stains out of them, I throw the fucking shirt out. That's what I do. You my shirt out, did you? <laughs> I don't use lighter fluid. Don't get me that. Even if it's the green lighter fluid that's coming out now. Don't get me a barbecue fork. Don't get me the multi-tool grilling thing that has the tongs and the fork and the chef's knife and all that other crap in it. I don't want that. And don't get me started on these best of lists where people give names of barbecue people of the year or most impressionable for 2018. They give you the names, but then they make you vote on these names. I mean, how weak is that? Let's have a popularity contest. If somebody has a really big social media following, but maybe they don't really deserve to be that 2018 person of the year, I mean, they're going to win. Like, have some balls and pick the winner yourself and then stand by your picks. Like, my boys over at, uh, what the hell was their name? That Heath Hall guy. Pork Barrel Barbecue. They were men. They used to give their lists. They picked who was number 10 through number 1. They stood by their picks, and they took the blowback. As it came in. Like, that's the real way to make a list. Pick a winner and stand by it. Don't be a pussy and uh, have the general public vote. What kind of a <laughs> list is that? Reminds me of that shilling with Rich guy. Nobody liked him. So there you go. I'm done. Questions, I'm concerns, done. comments? God, we need to get more fired up like Stephen Gray. We oh, my we were God. We back, man. Greg was on it. <laughs> um, John, or... Uh, Doug, were you disagreeing with grill grates? Do you think those are uh, a fad? Or you're just Actually, not a fan? you won me over with the last. Yes, I've never been a grill grate fan. Oh. But, you know, I the flipping it over and using yeah. it as a griddle uh -oh. is something that I need to try again. I haven't done it in like two or three years. Yeah. I'm going to do that this weekend uh, at my contest. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook my fajitas on the grill grates upside down. All right, let's quickly go back around the table. We kind of already touched on this subject, but I want to make sure that we have firm yeses or nos. Recently, the second Tuesday of the month guest sent out a mass email to people that are in his pitmasters club and said, "Hey, I'll give you two. I'll give you three years for the price of two. It'll save you whatever." Raising money, as he had mentioned on my show, his last appearance, he's self-publishing his second book which I believe is like Meathead, the art of barbecue and grilling or something along these lines. Getting away from traditional publishing, believes that it's an outdated method and that uh, he could potentially be a voice to lead people to self-publishing and that uh, he could be a champion of this. Look, we all know that Meathead has said from uh, many times of being on my show that it, it was not a labor of love, it was a labor of labor. 
which he did not love writing book number one. Now he's in book number two. I don't believe he's any more keen on writing a second book. I believe he said that in public, or at least he told me that in private, and I'm divulging, and I shouldn't have done that. So here's the question. Even self-publishing, do you believe, Steve Ray, that Meathead will produce a second Meathead book at some point? No. Because <laughs> said the book, what? The wow. And his the editor he already said the editor didn't agree with him. Yes. In in an, in an era where we are simplifying barbecue and he wants to take brisket and add art to it and think outside the box, when everybody now is just putting salt and pepper back on it and thinking inside the box, that's the book he wants to write. I don't think it's a good idea, and I don't. I think he will be bogged down in all the red and yellow tape of trying to publish your own book. So you see no production for Meathead? I don't see that book ever happening. All right, Doug, do you think that Meathead will produce a second book? Absolutely. He has put his name out there. He is going to deliver, and it will be within in a probably three to four months of when his original date was. All right, so He's Meathead. He'll do it. On the show, he said he was... March. March oh, of 2020. Sorry. Yep. So you think it's within three to four months of that? Yep, and that's what my uh, guess was. All right, no, uh, June, July. No names, please, yes. All right, David Huff, do you believe that Meathead will come out with a second book, yes or no? Yes, I think he will. Uh, what about time frame? Uh, I think he actually will get it done. It's always a little behind schedule on things like that, kind of like uh, Dr. Barbecue's restaurant. Hello. So I would say... Um, Probably about six months behind his time frame. All right, so here's what I'm going to say. I think Meathead uh, took the second book offer. I think he didn't like being told by his publisher how he should be steering his book. I think the uh, concept of self-publishing sounds pretty good to him. I have no idea what that actually is going to look like. I don't think Meathead has any idea what that's going to look like, and it's all a learning process. I don't think he likes to write. I think he likes to have the money, and who wouldn't like to have the money? I have no idea how much money he could stand to make or might be getting or anything like that. But I think that's intriguing, of course. But I think you have to do book writing because, first and foremost, you like writing books. I mean, Stephen Reichlin writes books because he likes writing books. Uh, Adrian Miller writes books because he likes writing books. I mean, the guys that are doing it and doing it well, that's first and foremost in their whole ability to produce. They like the process. I don't think Meathead really likes the process. I think he, if, if, so, if he could snap his fingers and the book would be just as good as the first one, he would happily do that. And I agree. You will never, ever, ever find me writing a freaking book, let alone reading a book. I'm not going to write one. I can tell you that. So having said all of that, I'm here to tell you that Meathead will produce that second book. And it's not going to be in March of 2020, but I would goddamn guarantee it's probably going to be June of 2020. So, uh, and I kind of agree with Doug. Like, his, he said he was going to do it. So, not producing a book, I don't think, is an option for Meathead. And if Steve ends up being right, we will all readjourn here on an embedded correspondence segment and be kissing the king's ring. So, what can I tell you? you you can pay my airfare for the big embedded correspondence meetup. There you go. All right. So in the meantime, uh, this is the embedded correspondence segment. We thank John Solberg for popping in at the very beginning in the uh, beginning of the second or the second hour. Uh, you have Doug Scheiding, my oldest embedded correspondent from Texas. You have Steve Ray from Tennessee and David Huff in Oklahoma. Thanks again to John Solberg from Michigan for joining me. Uh, guys, always appreciate the time, and we will see you for what will be built as a two-hour embedded correspondence segment on Christmas Day, everybody! <laughs> <laughs> I assume we'll have to uh, talk about logistics on that, but gentlemen, always appreciate the time, and thanks so much for coming on. That's the Ooh. embedded All correspondence segment. via the Traeger Grills hotline. Mm -mm -mm. And just like that... Hello, everybody, this is Gary All right, Bay. get the ID the in. Chuck, right. host of Wine Library TV, Way a.k.a. WLTV, Way and this is BBQ Central. All right, uh, let me talk to you quickly about Traeger Grills. 
Behind every great meal is a great grill, but not just any grill, a Traeger grill. And the Timberline is Traeger's most advanced grill yet. It allows you to grill, smoke, bake, roast, braise, and barbecue like a pro, no matter what your level. Thanks to the incredible wood-fired taste. Seriously, you don't know flavor till you're cooking with it. Traeger grills use all natural hardwood pellets as fuel, so you're literally cooking with flavor, from low and slow smoked ribs to a seared steak. Even a baked apple pie, Traeger grills can handle it all. And the Traeger Timberline makes it even easier thanks to the Wi-Fi capability. You can check on cooks, kick up the temperature, and set custom cook cycles anytime, anywhere, all right from your phone through the Traeger Grill app. In fact, if I had my Traeger Grill app right now and I had brisket on, I could check on it right now. You can find a Traeger dealer or check them out online, TraegerGrills.com, if you want to beef up that barbecue game of yours. Or if you're looking for a unique gift to give somebody you love, Traeger Shop Class is going coast to coast, bringing barbecue knowledge and amazing wood-fired food everywhere they go, taught by professional pitmasters. You'll take home all the skills you need to reach barbecue glory, find a shop class near you, and sign up today, TraegerGrills.com slash shop class. That's TraegerGrills.com slash shop class. Back to wrap up the show right after this. Stick around. Be right back. Whole packers, full racks, legs and thighs, injecting butts. If you've never heard this before, you might think you found the best triple X show ever. Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Greg Rimpy. All right, welcome back. Thanks again to the Embedded Correspondents for joining me most of this hour. They are, once again, Doug Scheiding in Texas, Steve Ray in Tennessee, David Huff in Oklahoma, John Solberg in Michigan. And there you have it. All right. Um, maybe we will generate some kind of a final Embedded Correspondents gift list and post it. Maybe we won't. If you missed it, you can go back through and listen to all of our suggestions and offerings. Subscribe to the show, as always, in case you miss a live segment. You never have to worry about missing a guest or a topic or anything like that anymore. As long as you subscribe to the podcast, the first hour is released on Wednesdays, the second hour released on Thursdays, and the best Barbecue Central show in 10 minutes or less every Friday, produced by John Solberg. All the way back in the first hour, we talked with Jimmy Daniel from Primitive Pits, PrimitivePits.com, their website. We also talked with the pizza expert of the Barbecue Central Show, the official pizza expert of the Barbecue Central Show, Matt Frampton from Barbecue Revolution, BBQRevolution.com, his website. And then in the second hour, it was the embedded correspondence going over a lot of gifts that they would give, gifts that we don't want, and gifts that we're secretly hoping for. Big show planned for you next Tuesday, as always. September 11th, 2001. I will never forget. Until next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, this is your program host and proud U.S. American, Greg Rempe. Good night now.